Hi everyone, welcome to our kickoff launch party. I am so excited to get the Dog Nutrition Summit started. And so I chose three of my favorite veterinary nutritionists in the world, and literally we are worldwide, to get the launch started. So my guests today are Dr. Nick Thompson. He's a veterinarian who has been fighting for responsible, species-appropriate raw food feeding for pets for over 25 years. His tireless drive for healthy pets from birth to graceful old age brought him to raw feeding in the mid-1990s. He's the founding president of the International Raw Feeding Veterinary Society and has co-authored a pioneering worldwide survey of 79 veterinarians and their experiences feeding raw food. Awesome. He has co-organized international raw food conferences for the Raw Feeding Veterinary Society since 2014. And we'll have him talk about his topic a little bit later, but he will be discussing is a vegan diet good for pets? He has very strong opinions with very good reasons for those opinions. And it's uh, a great interview that I, I know you will not want to miss. And we also have Dr. Ian Billinghurst. And Dr. Ian Billinghurst is a nutritionist, agricultural scientist, veterinary surgeon, acupuncturist, and nutritional consultant, and he is from down under, so he's in a totally different time zone than the rest of us are. <laughs> he's the author of Give Your Dog a Bone, Grow Your Pups with Bones, and The Barf Diet, which discusses the basic principles of canine nutrition using raw, whole, and commonly available foods. Great books. I recommend them for everyone. He conducts clinical and literature research into nutrition, writes and lectures on evolutionary nutrition, and produces his own brand of pet food. And uh, Dr. Billinghurst during the summit will be talking about raw food for pancreatitis, which is a huge, huge issue, at least here in the States. I don't know if it's as big a deal in other countries, but I get a lot of emails about pancreatitis and whether those dogs can eat raw food and how to feed them. So a uh, really important topic. And then we also have Dr. Barbara Royal, who is the founder and owner of the Royal Treatment Veterinary Center in Chicago. What a great last name to be able to use in all your stuff. I love it. Co-founder of the Royal Animal Health University. CEO of the College of Integrative Veterinary Therapies, and co-owner of the Animal Diet Formulator. She's an internationally renowned pioneer in integrative veterinary medicine and a passionate advocate of common sense and cutting-edge approaches to optimal animal health. Dr. Royal takes an active role not only in practicing medicine, but also teaching, mentoring, and supporting colleagues and students as they further their careers in veterinary medicine. And Dr. Royal will be talking during the summit about the dangers of commercial pet food and kibble, another really eye-opening topic. So I want to talk, um, welcome everyone, thank you so much for agreeing to come to our kickoff. Uh, it's a party. <laughs> <laughs> it's a party for some of us it's it's uh, very early in the morning for some of us it's very late in the evening but it's a party <laughs> we don't care we party all day long there you go <laughs> all right so why should you care about the nutrition for your dog why is it important what 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 are we all talking about this for well the proper balance of nutrients is essential when feeding your dog dogs need a certain combination of protein fats a little bit of carbohydrate, vitamins, minerals, and water every day in order to function normally. Each and every nutrient in your dog's food has a purpose. Without adequate nutrition, your dog would not be able to maintain muscle tone, build and repair muscles, teeth, and bone, perform normal daily activities with ease, or fight off infection. Proteins provide a source of energy and help with muscle function and growth. Fats provide energy, help the brain function, and keep the skin and hair coat shiny and healthy. Vitamins and minerals are necessary for muscle contraction and nerve conduction, condu conduction <laughs> and they work to prevent disease. Every single cell in the body is made up of protein. It is integral in building skin, hair, muscles, organs, and other tissues. Protein is necessary to repair damaged cells and make new ones. Protein is especially important for young, growing, and pregnant animals. The protein in your dog's diet ensures he is able to build and maintain strong muscles. 
Everyone knows that a dog with a rich, shiny hair coat is most likely in good health. This is because dogs eating the proper balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids will have skin that is healthy, which produces hair with a nice sheen. Skin that is dry will lead to hair that easily splits and breaks and falls out. Foods with adequate omega-3 fatty acids have an anti-inflammatory effect to reduce itching and other irritations and inflammatory problems in the body caused by environmental or uh, allergic conditions. Fiber in the diet helps in digestion and elimination. Dogs must, uh, foods must be formulated so that the needed ingredients are readily available to your dog's digestive system and thus easily absorbed by the body. Digestibility is important, so your dog can use all the nutrients in his food and easily rid his body of waste products. Your dog's food should provide all the nutrition he needs while producing only a minimum of stool to be picked up as the end result. The vitamins and minerals found in dog food work together to keep your dog's immune system and metabolism functioning normally. Vitamins work to reduce the damage done to body cells on a daily basis, and minerals promote the normal function of the cells that maintain health. Without adequate levels of vitamins and minerals, your pet would eventually become ill. The right balance of good quality nutrition can decrease your dog's levels of stress, helping him be calmer and more relaxed. By providing the proper, proper nutrition that the body needs, your dog will have less of a tendency to exhibit unwanted behaviors. Of equal importance to the basic nutrients a dog needs is the quality of the source of those nutrients. Food that provides excess sugar and unhealthy chemicals can cause dogs who are already aggressive, anxious, hyper, or fearful to be even more so. Trying to find the right food for your dog based on its late... Trying to find the right food for your dog just based on the label can be confusing, to say the least. Each brand of food tries to differentiate itself from its competitors. Sure, it's easy to find food that is appropriate for puppies versus overweight or elderly dogs, but how do you know exactly what type of food to buy? The best way to differentiate what the manufacturer is advertising and what the quality of the product really is, is to learn how to read what's in the label. Although there is a wide variety of meat sources like chicken, lamb, turkey, venison, beef, and even fish options like salmon, you should take note there are different grades of meat used in pet food. Providing high quality dog food to your dog not only helps keep your dog healthy, but it could also result in less veterinary visits. So, <clears throat> what I'd like now is for each of our speakers to give us a little bit of a preview about their topic. So I'm um, going to start with Dr. Nick Thompson. And um, you and I had a lot of fun during our interview about vegan diets for dogs. So you want to give us a, a quick little synopsis on that? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, really, isn't it? You know, you've... <laughs> Who in this world would feed a cow on a steak? Who would feed a horse on a rack of lamb? It's, you know, it's, 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 it really is that simple. And yet many manufacturers who also manufacture kibble, which therefore suggests that kibble may not be all it's cracked up to be, but many manufacturers they're jumping on a bandwagon. They, they think that, that people are getting keen on veganism and they are saying, well, if you're feeding yourself vegan, then why not feed your dog vegan? And that's, you know, as a concept, well, maybe. <laughs> but the reality is you don't feed horses on steaks. You don't feed dogs on vegan food because dogs are carnivores. And so... If you want to feed a dog appropriately, you've got to feed them as they were meant to be. We are omnivores, which means that we can become quite carnivorous or we can become quite vegetarian or quite uh, even even go into vegan veganism. The problem with, with, with that is that you have to use supplements. And therefore, if you're using supplements, is that diet complete? And the same is true for the for the for the foods that we feed our dogs. In order to create a vegan food for a dog, you've got to use supplements. And if, for me, the definition of a, of a complete whole and natural diet is one that doesn't require supplementation in order to be balanced and, 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 and give everything that is needed for the 
uh, for the dog. So there's the species appropriate argument. And some people say, well, we need to feed dogs on vegan diets because there's not going to be enough meat to feed the, the human population in the future. And this I absolutely reject because I think that using modern farming methods, yes, the we're going to run out of meat. We're going to we're going to um, we're going to run out of soil on which to grow good uh, meat and, and even plants. So so in the future, if we carry on with modern modern non regenerative uh, agriculture, we're all vegans, vegetarians, carnivores. We're all going to run out of food. So we've got to do something else. So for me, the future is regenerative agriculture. It's not just uh, organic, which is where you stop using sprays. It's you are you are using cattle, ruminants, sheep, and and, and cattle, and pigs to to to. Uh, to fertilize the soil naturally as they have been doing for millions and millions of years before men and women came along. And in that way, and as far as I can see, and I've looked a very, very long way on this topic, that is the only way the judicious holistic management is called mob grazing of, of, of cattle and sheep, pigs. That's the only way we're going to build soil, because at the moment we are on a very slippery slope uh, to lose soil. So the, the WHO say that, was, and it's, it's not very accurate, but it gives you a good, good idea. 40 to 60. We've got 40 to 60 harvests left before we can't really grow very much. People like George Monbiot says, oh, it's OK. We can just have big bioreactors and we can just let the, let the entire world go to become a wild place. Who wants to eat <laughs> beef ragu made from bacteria in a vat that's doled out to millions of people? You know, I, you know, I don't, wouldn't want to live in a world like that. So, George, thank you, but no, absolutely not. <laughs> Our ruminants are—they are grass cutters and collectors. They are—they are. They are Pro grass processors and they are grass and dung and fertilizer distributors all in one machine and they taste great and they're <laughs> super nutritious and they give us nutrients we re that we require that we can't even get from a, a vegan diet so if people so i'm just wrapping up now if people <laughs> want to be vegan great go for it do your research and realize that animals die even in the production of plant material. But if you want to be vegan, that's absolutely great. But please leave the dog in a place of carnivory. Even if you feed it a kibble, the kibble has meat. It's meat meal, which is meat only by a very fine definition. But, but uh, the ideal is to feed either fresh or raw food, I would suggest raw because that's what they've been eating for the last 45 million years. But I'd say dogs should eat meat and 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 vegetables and really good nutritious food. Horses should eat grass. Cattle should eat grass. Let's just keep it real. <laughs> Thank you very much. So for those of you watching, can I just say carnivory? <laughs> I, I want carnivory. Yeah, I want, no, I no, want that word. Get it. You get it in, in a big vat. Barbara, <laughs> you'd be eating exactly the same as I'd be eating every day. And we'd be able to say, how is the 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 uh, beef slush today? And you go, oh, it's kind of like it was yesterday. And it was like it was the day before. You know, it's like. Pfft. I just saw a pet food company just got $17.5 million to produce that way. So it's coming down down the the oh, pipe but yeah. so for those of you uh who are who are joining us for this kickoff you can see that dr nick thompson is pretty animated about this topic so you'll you'll get a whole 45 to 60 minutes of that during our interview and he was just as much fun during the interview so you'll you'll get a lot more on that topic it was really fun and the adorable <laughs> british accent and the adorable uh, british accent yes uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. okay 
So we're going to move over to Dr. Ian Billinghurst. And um, Dr. Ian, if you would be nice enough to give us a little synopsis of raw food for pancreatitis. This was a really interesting interview, too. I actually, I, I learned a couple of things during our interview that I'm using on one of my dogs. It, it didn't have anything to do with pancreatitis, but it was still something that you said that just was a little spark. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. But talk to us about raw food for pancreatitis. <laughs> Dr. Judy, I think this kickoff party has started with drinks well beforehand. <laughs> As I recall, you and I have spoken about pancreatitis just recently. Well, I suspect in your summit, I spoke about a biologically appropriate raw food diet. Uh, oh. <laughs> You're right. We did pancreatitis in your summit, I think. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Biologically appropriate raw foods. Man, oh, man. No, there's been no drinking yet. There's just been, I can't work my computer. Okay. Let's talk about, hey, you're right. We did. Exactly. Biologically appropriate raw foods, of course, the barf diet. No, you said this was a party, though. This is a party. It's a party. Oh, it's a, it's a party. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, You've got to watch a different summit to talk about pancreatitis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm very happy to talk about pancreas. <laughs> no, let's talk about the barf diet. <laughs> can give us just like something. <laughs> it's, it's actually pancreas is actually one of my favourite things to treat with a raw food diet. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> it works like a charm. <laughs> it does, absolutely, and you can feed a whole lot more fat and protein when it's raw than you ever could with that terrible kibble stuff. The okay. creative problem in the, the first place. Are evil. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Nick, just before I say what what, what uh, Judy would like me to talk about, or, or she now she would like me to talk about. Oh, your topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, what would you like to talk about? We can talk about the weather. <laughs> I absolutely ten thousand uh, percent agree with you, and sadly so, because. We are destroying our soils. And if we destroy our soils, mm -hmm. and this is what we should be worrying about. Yeah. If we, all these people who are worried about climate change worry about our soils because if we ain't got soils, we ain't got anything. And we are destroying our soils. Anyway, so let me reinforce what Dr. Nick just said. Most important. They've done this an awful lot. Yeah. I never, it's just silly to say an awful lot of work. They've done a lot of work. It was very good work, actually, not awful. But they've done an awful lot of work with bison on this and a tremendous amount of research. And, yes, the ruminants are so important to our future health, uh, just the opposite to what they're saying. Anyway, moving on, biologically appropriate raw food diets. My goodness. Ah, this, this again, it's a bit like um, Nick said with, with vegans. Um, we need to feed the animals, our animals, our dogs, with the food they evolved to require. It really is that simple. It's their evolutionary program of nutrition. Get down to the science, it's what their geno genome was designed to use. So simple. So, number, so that's number one. That's what a biologically appropriate raw food diet, whatever formulation it's in, whether it's Franken-Prey, whether it's all ground up and mixed together, whether it's whole prey, which isn't always suitable for young dogs, by the way. You've got to have more bones in there for young dogs. Give your dog a bone, my first book. Anyway, so evolutionary program of nutrition. And I, again, I talk about that in some detail. Um, the formulation must be based on food, not nutrients. If you feed the right foods in the correct balance and the correct amounts, the nutrients naturally follow. And even better if you can feed stuff that's been organically raised on beautiful, deep, rich soil that has been absorbing carbon from the atmosphere with all those wonderful soil microbiome. Nick, that's where you talk to us. This is and it's so basic. It's what we need to be doing. And finally, the third topic I really hammered home was balance should maybe and probably better achieved over time. This is important. You don't have to make every meal complete and balanced. That is necessary 
if you're flogging some terrible processed pet food because you've got to make that claim. It's got to be legally complete and balanced. And by the way, legally complete and balanced is a hell of a long way from biologically complete and balanced. And I make this point very strongly in my lecture as well. So yeah. these are the points that I speak about. Um, there's a whole lot more. I am just about, looked at some notes I made earlier looking at what I, I did, did uh, talk about. Um, and the other thing I think just one, oh, no, 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 I'm going to reserve that for later on. I think I've said enough. It, it, it must, you must feed their evolutionary program of nutrition, feed food and let the nutrients take care of themselves. The food's in the right balance. And you, and you have to understand those principles of evolutionary nutrition. And, and a lot of my books cover that, well, all of them in many ways, and my lectures. Um, but feed food and don't worry about it because if you do that, it's all going to work beautifully well. It's a very simple program. That's, that's really my most important point. This is very simple. Most people want to make it difficult. But do achieve balance over time. Okay, I think I've said enough. There's so much more we could say, but <laughs> hey, come to the come and to the summit and watch the lecture and get the the full idea. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it, I didn't talk about pancreatitis, but that's okay. But uh, that was one of the things that I loved about your lecture was talking about like why do we try to make this so difficult, and especially with social media and people in your ear and and getting in your face and telling you that you're doing it all wrong and. And I had somebody today tell me that I was doing it all wrong with the organ meats that I was using in something. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, we're going to make this really complicated and we're going to have an argument over it. I, don't, I really don't want to. But uh, it, I think it's oh, just... Can I one point there? Sure. <laughs> the wolves that they reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park, and it was probably 20, 30, 40 years ago, they all use Excel spreadsheets to ensure that the food they eat is correct. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. specially trained wolves. Okay, that's... that's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you have very, very smart wolves there. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, Dr. Barbara Royal, the dangers of commercial pet food and kibble. This was another really fun... Uh, this will be another fun hour for people to watch because we had a good time with that too. But give, give us a little, little peek inside there. Yeah, it's dangerous in there, so don't look too hard. <laughs> I think that's basically what I feel like, you know, the pet food industry is sort of saying to us half the time, like, don't look back, don't look too hard, don't look back here. It's, it's you know, look at the front, we've got pictures and we've got shiny stuff and it says natural all over it. So, you know, that's one of the dangers for me really is just the fact that the industry is talking so loud to everybody and nobody else is really, you know, saying, well, that's not really true. So I have clients who, you know, are believing stuff. It's a big danger that the commercial pet food industry is a multi-billion dollar monster that wants to feed itself on the expense of, at the expense of, of all of our, you know, the health of all of our patients. So that's a big danger. And we need to watch out for that. I think also a big danger is that <laughs> veterinarians, we need to take back this conversation, Right. I think, I think we need to take back the conversation about health, about the health of our largest patient, which is planet Earth. And we need to be the ones who say, because we're everywhere. Veterinarians are everywhere. We can do this. We can do it for the food animals because we love them. We can do it for plants and, thing, and all that because they're part of all of this. And we can do it for the soil and make a big difference. So I do feel like commercial pet food takes us to a place where I think as veterinarians, if we're really looking, we're recognizing the poor quality in there because it, it really has very little to do with the natural order of things or what we're feeding. If you look at the list of recipes and you do look, even though it's dangerous, <laughs> you know, that's what we talked about. Like you look at the ingredients and go, oh my gosh, what am I feeding my pet? <laughs> and so the, those list of ingredients is going to be, maybe there's going to be something you might recognize in the first few, but it's often going to be something like pearled barley and rice and corn gluten meal, and maybe there'll be quinoa. I don't know. But but then there might be some meals of, of different type of meat meal, which could pretty much be anything. And then where then why is it there's also a huge paragraph at the end of most of the kibble foods with all kinds of, you're talking about supplementing. Oh, that's just, that's not even supplementing. That's creating a novel of supplements. <laughs> you can't even read to the end. You fall asleep. You're like, eh, no. <laughs> 
So we need to change this conversation so that we're understanding this is, this is not natural. These kibble foods are, are, are high heat processed. They provide two very horrible, potent carcinogens in every bite because of the high heat processing. So there's going to be an acrylamide and a heterocyclic amine. We also are knowing that a kibble food, in order just to keep it all stuck together in a cute little kibble, we have to put so much carbohydrate in there that you're feeding a, a carnivore, in the cat's case, an obligate carnivore, with food that has you know often somewhere between 40 and 50 and 60% sugar, because that's what carbohydrates are, right? They break into smaller pieces, which are all sugars. So we're feeding so much sugar all of us have to get a grip and say, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It's, it's dangerous as anything out there if you don't look. And we need to be looking and making a difference here. So it's, I mean, that's why, you know, that's why we, we, I did the animal diet formulator, not because I feel like we have to know exactly every nutrient all the time to make everything perfect, but we have to know that we're way off track. <laughs> that's what having an animal diet formula is and making it something that we now it's not an excel spreadsheet it's in the cloud we can play with it we can make it our own we can say this is what we're looking for and we can look at diets and i can prove to people that a, a, a kibble food is not actually doing what it's supposed to do i can evaluate that i can evaluate over time if you want to do balance over time we can say yeah you're going to get it if you sort of do this and that's a wonderful thing. And we all, again, I just feel like if, let's take back this conversation. Let's know a little more and do a little more. And I think pet owners are the advocates for that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the pet food industry is not on our side. If that's news to you, they really just want to sell something. So some of them are, but that's always the exception to the rule. But let's find those. Let's find those for our, our patients. Let's find those for our clients so that they can spend their money that they work really hard on and give it to companies that are also doing right thing, right reason. And don't give it to companies that are trying to fool us. So that's my take <laughs> on the commercial industry and pet food that way for kibble versus fresh, appropriate, raw food. A lot of great companies out there helping you with that. You can do a lot yourself. We can do better. We can do better. I think if uh, if pet owners will look at the companies that spend lots and lots of advertising dollars, those are the ones that are spending very little in ingredients. <laughs> right? Because what are they doing? They don't have the money to spend it on ingredients. They just did that huge marketing campaign. <laughs> That's where the money goes. That is where the money is. It's not going in the bags. But, you know, to your, to your point, Barbara, um, and I think you and I talked about this uh, during our discussion, but I mean, we are a group of veterinarians who obviously are very much into feeding our dogs a biologically appropriate diet, preferably a raw food diet. Um, but the majority, vast majority of veterinarians are not on that playing field. And so I think, uh, I think you're right. It's going to have to be the dog owners, the pet owners bringing this topic to the veterinarians and saying, no, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a man. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to feed this stuff that I can't read the ingredient label on because it's not working. <laughs> now, a, it's not working. I mean, the, the, reason, the only reason I'm really doing any of this for me is because it wasn't working. <laughs> As a veterinarian, how frustrating is that to have animals coming back and back and back with the same problems? You know, it's like, no, this is not working. We, I want to use what works. And the pet, I think you're right. Owners need to come and say, I want you to know more about this. I don't want you to talk out of your hat and pretend you know because you heard this from a company and it's balanced and complete and we got to do this kibble food. Please don't do that anymore to me. Don't, don't underestimate my ability to just look things up. I'm <laughs> mad that I looked on Google because everybody does, including yeah. the doctors. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, yeah we, we have to, I think we have to change where the conversation is coming from um, because I, I, I read something AVMA statistics the other day, but, you know, like 95,000 veterinarians that are in the AVMA and, you know, probably 90,000 of them are promoting food that I would never feed my, my dogs. So. Yeah, I'm trying not to drop it on the floor because my aunt will get sick. <laughs> Barbara, what, well, what, what, about, what, so what would you say to the, the thought that um, vets are taught not to be excited about food and therefore there is a, there is a, a vacuum, a food-shaped vacuum into which the, the big food companies come? 
for I, sure. I, because I, I don't want to think about it. Nutrition's boring. Surgery is that, interesting. They think they're above <laughs> it, don't they? They think that, oh, food, yeah, why, why, why do I bother with food? There are companies who will provide me with a, 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 a yeah. swanky, shiny uh, kibble. And I can just, you know, think yeah. about exciting things like surgery and medicine and tablets. And no, I was, I was that. I remember being that, that coming out of school. Like, I'm oh, sure yeah. I got an A in nutrition because it was so boring, but all I did was listen to what they told me and spot it back. And then I don't ever have to talk about nutrition again. Just look over there in the store. <laughs> yeah. you know? so and it's, it's crazy, what I'm yeah. hearing, Barbara, from what you've said, really, our pet parents out there who are on Google and who are looking things up, they need to actually shame their veterinarians <laughs> thinking about <laughs> because that's what they need to do. They need to shame them because they I... need to be, our veterinarians need to be ashamed of what they believe and what they think about food. I mean, you would say to them, hey, you don't feed that sort of rubbish to yourself nor to your yeah. kids. Why on earth do you recommend it for our dogs? What's yeah. wrong with you? Well, they need to be shamed. <laughs> you have to go, because veterinarians are, I, I really honestly believe that veterinarians are some of the most wonderful people on the planet. Absolutely. You know, I love my profession so much and I love my colleagues, wherever they are and whatever they're doing, because they're super fun. We're great at parties, speaking of parties. <laughs> and I love that. But I agree with you because I think there's a point at which we're sort of going, well, and I hear this all the time, right? So just today in this room right over there, I had a client who said to me, you know, I can't tell my veterinarian that I feed fresh raw food, so I have to come here to talk about that. I'm like, and she was like two hours away, so she can't come here all the time. I'm like, but you need to, like, you need to just say, ah, no more yeah. about this. Help me. Yeah. So you're right. You shame them for their lack of knowledge, their lack of interest in genuine nutrition for animals. That's that, that's the only way. Look, I I haven't said that ever before. I've said it first here. I've been very tolerant over the years and just said, look, our vets are trained as callow young people to believe that this rubbish is real food. And and because everything else is so well done in their training, they just assume, makes an ass out of you and me, they assume the nutrition course is exactly the same, but it's not. Yeah. And now they're adults. They're, they're, they were kids when they went through, perhaps, you know, under 25. Now they're adults. They've got to think like adults and they have to think about nutrition for animal like adults and not just believe that rubbish they were taught. It fits in with nothing else in their biological training. It, fits, it doesn't fit in with Darwinian evolution, which is the basis of the most complex um, science that we know, which, which is molecular biology. I, I know we've gotten off course, but my goodness, it is time. But this, this is good. This is for a party. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of it, the veterinarians are not well-trained and well-versed in nutrition, so they feel very threatened when a, a well-educated client comes in and says, no, I'm, I'm going to do it this way, and I want you to help me do it. And the problem is they don't know how to help them do it. So it becomes, it's just so much easier to say, no, I have a complete and balanced thing here in a bag. Uh, just take this and, and we'll be done. Uh, rather than learning how to do an animal diet formulator or, you know, learning how taking to, taking to, yeah, taking a course. We're all overworked and exhausted. And yep. particularly nowadays, and, and veterinarians are feeling the stress and the strain of a job that's not well done all the time. <laughs> it's really hard. I think that's yeah. the suicide rates. That's all this stuff. But but learn about this, and you'll. I, I just wish that veterinarians knew how excited I am, and the veterinarians <laughs> that come to my practice when we work together. We are so excited about every day because it's going to work. That's right. And, and the thing is, they are going to have a much nicer job when the, what they recommend in the way of food actually helps to treat the problems that they're having so much difficulty dealing with, and it's causing so much stress. My goodness, it is so simple. It's there before their eyes. It, it, I know. And, the, and I'm now beginning to think that the only way we can do this is for pet parents to, because I'm up until now I've said, look, just take your dog in, it's healthy, and show it to them. Yes, and what happens? The, the vet says, oh, what a healthy one dog. That's magnificent. What do you feed it? <gasps> You're going to kill your dog. <laughs> 
and, and this, so now we have to stop. No, no, Mr. Vet, Mrs. Vet, Dr. Vet, whatever you are, you are wrong. You have to get your head around this. You have, yeah. We have to feed bi biologically appropriate diets. And by the way, the acronym for that is BAD. <laughs> We've gone from barf to bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I can't bad find the best It's bad to the bone. <laughs> oh, bad to the bone. Bad to the bone. We're going right, so. to do, do a conference on that. Bad to the bone, right? Everybody has friends. <laughs> sure. sure, there you go. Okay. Now that we got way off in left field, but it was fun. Um, so we we were given a case study, and I would I'm really excited to hear each of your take on this and what you would do if this particular pet were brought into your office. So we have Frankie, a four year old French bulldog who has been eating kibble since he was a puppy. Because what else would you do? And he's showing signs of severe gut issues. His parents recently tried switching over to a raw diet based on recommendations they read on social media. Yay. Since switching over to raw, Frankie has only gotten worse and is now not eating um and so each of you i'm going to give you each a few minutes and what i would like to to know is if this dog and these pet parents made their way into your clinic and said look i really want to do this it's not working now he's not eating anything at all it's just gone south what what would your approach to this be because i know that there are going to be so many people watching this summit who are in this exact position where they're like i tried every time i put anything other than you know the, whatever's kibble horrible thing he's been eating every time i give him a little bit of people food or i try to give him something raw it just goes south so dr nick you get to go first okay i see this a lot i see this kind of question a lot and uh, so I'm just going to take some simple things to leave my wonderful colleagues plenty of opportunity to, to, to spread their wings. But so just really simple things to start with. I would say it's probably not the raw that's causing the problem because there are thousands and millions of dogs around the, around the country who are eating raw. Absolutely no problem. So it's not raw per se. It might be one of the proteins that you are feeding. And what people tend to do is they start with inevitably chicken or beef. And my mantra to my clients is the three most allergenic foodstuffs that I come across is wheat, beef and chicken. So for the first thing I would do is to to remove those. And I would say, why don't we try something just really uh, left field? Let's try him on something that's going to be really delicious, like either lamb or venison, something like that. And the reason I'm thinking about lamb, which perhaps in the States might be difficult to get, I don't know, but, but in, the, in this country, it's very easy to get in, in Australia. The, the Australians invented sheep. Did you know that? They actually <laughs> invented them. Very clever. About 50 years ago, there were no sheep in the world. Then they invented them. And now there's more sheep in Australia than there is anything else. True no, story. No, no, True story. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. So, so I, I would say, Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about we're going to think about lamb. So we're going to get some lamb bones. We're going to make some, some bone broth. We're going to boil those lamb bones for 48 hours. We're going to make the most amazing lamb uh, broth because broth is very attractive. It's very healing and it's very um, uh, uh, nutritious to the gut, to the gut, to the biome, to the dog. OK. And there's very few dogs uh, I know who would turn their nose up at a lamb uh bone broth so um we would then i think i would try him on some lamb um lamb tripe okay because again very 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 attractive it's disgusting stuff it stinks <laughs> and it's horrible and what have you but dogs love it and it's really good for them okay so lamb tripe is very easy to digest it's very attractive and i would say that's the first thing i would say i'd go in with uh, you know, there are lots of other things. There. Prebiotics, probiotics, duh, 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 duh. But I'm not going to go down that road just for now. I'm going to say really simple. I'm going to go uh, uh, bone broth and lamb 
tripe. That's where I'm going to go. And I would suggest what I tend to do with with my clients is I, I get them to do a spreadsheet. So you've got a date going down on the left hand side, and then you'll do uh, what was being fed and appetite level and any vomiting, any uh, what the stool score. Ten out of ten is a perfect uh, sausage <laughs> that you can pick up with two fingers. Zero is soup. Um, uh, any medication the dogs are on, what the diet was, because then you can you've got it all there, and they can that you can look at it, they can look at it, and they can take it into their veterinarian and say, look, we are taking a systematic approach to a logical and biologically appropriate raw food diet. Isn't this fantastic? And then once we've got them settled, if he if he will settle, and I think he will, on the lamb tripe, then we can move on to say a bit of lamb. Then we can go for a bit of venison, which is quite similar. Then we can go to say a little bit of rabbit. Not dogs like rabbit; they've been eating it for forty five million years. And, and and on our spreadsheet, we say right, we've got two weeks of tripe. Then we've got two weeks of lamb. Then we've got two weeks of venison. That's how I would start these things. Um, That's great. Sorry, I've, I've overplayed my hand I, I, Well, I love it. Uh, from a Chinese medicine perspective, like treats like. So tripe is the stomach of the ruminant. So, you know, you just did a little TCVM nutrition there. Yay. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. Right. okay, Dr. Billinghurst, what are you going to do with Frankie, who is just not interested now? <laughs> well, first of all, don't panic. That's number one. Next, we actually we need a diagnosis. What what is actually going on? As Nick said, there are thousands, millions of dogs being read for, for being read for food, being fed raw food. Um, <laughs> that's another oh, indication. This is a party, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's quite normal. Please understand, it's quite normal for dogs to eat raw. It's got to be some component of that diet that is causing the problem. So the first thing I do when any patient comes in to me with anything, anything like this, this dog is, what, four years old or something, Frankie? Yeah. Before, I need a history. I need a history of what this dog has eaten all its life from, from where to go, as best they can remember. And what, what was the dog eating just before it was transitioned? And most importantly, what was it transitioned to? And this is, this is, was this just an all meat diet, which is probably what a lot of people think a raw food diet is? And what meat was it? Was it terribly fatty? Was it just what was it? And what, what was the reaction straight away? Did the dog love it? Did the dog hate it? Um, was it, did, was there diarrhea? Was there vomiting? I need to know exactly what's, what's going on. And we can look at the state of the, uh, the feces that have been coming out. Was it, was, did, did it come out? As, as little squirts and, 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 and was, in other words, and, and covered in mucus and or blood, fresh blood. So was it a large bowel problem or was it a small bowel problem where it's come through in great volumes of partially undigested food that didn't smell terribly? So I need to know what's going on, why, what's going on. And we need, to, we need to then restore this bowel. And how do we do that? Well, well the dog's been resting anyway because it's not eating. And what are we, what are we going to give it? Well. Sadly, we're probably going to return to something it did used to like. See if that is okay. Well, this dog will eat. And, and we just gradually have to work this dog back. So strangely enough, one of the first things, there are several approaches we can take at this point. Um, and it will depend upon the individual. So this is very much an experienced vet who's dealt with a lot of these things over the years. Because everybody is different. Every body has, has got a different dog with a different genetic profile, a, a different history of feeding, and a different approach to introduction to raw. So it will depend a lot then on that history. So in my life, history taking has been one of the most important things we can possibly do and then proceed from there. And it's, it's quite an open field. Um, we can go with Strombeck's chicken and rice. And I know people are trying to debunk that, but I can tell you now that a, a family member who has a Labrador, and the, this is this Labrador is called Billy, by the way, and, and, um, and Billy is the is is the consummate, the most ultimate Labrador. This Billy would eat all day. 
all day, <laughs> every day. Each you, if you lay down. Well, not really, because he just loves people, but she loves people. But Billy would eat and eat and eat. But then Billy stopped eating. Oh, and that, that's, of course, the other thing I would do. Uh, I'll get back to Billy. The first thing I'm going to do is take that dog's temperature, of course. I'm going to see if this dog is really sick. What's going on? Have we got a, a, a real major problem here? Uh, we may do some blood work as well. Most of the time I don't, you know, because you can see this dog bounces in reasonably well. It's just got squirty backside. Anyway, Billy was quite sick, running a temperature, had to go on antibiotics by the vet. I wasn't the vet in charge. But then, then the vet put the, the Billy on chicken and rice and immediately cleared up. I suggested also to my daughter, that he also have, or she will have some slippery elm bark powder. And over years, I've also made up a, a mix of um, tea, um, lemon, and, and, and um, yeah, basically tea and lemon and a little bit of honey. And that's been very soothing to the bowel. But the, the rice in chicken and rice, the, the, the starch off that is also very soothing to the bowel, as is um slippery on bark powder but i may not use that it just depends on the problem so again i guess it just depends upon what, what's going on in some cases because they've just started off with some very fatty meat and often it was lamb by the way strangely enough so it was lamb and it was fatty lamb and the dog immediately had a bad reaction to it i said can i just get you for the next week to feed nothing but chicken wings or chicken necks and Often that would simply tighten it up brilliantly um, because I could go back to my first book, Give Your Dog a Bone. <laughs> and, of course, in England, one of the most important things that was used, and I'm not sure whether it still is, is, in fact, the tribe. And why? Because we're restoring the microbiome uh, by all those gut microbiological creatures living in, in the ruminant, in the ruminant of the ruminant. But... Diagnosis is important. Do we have a real infection going on? Is it large bowel or small bowel? Um, and how are we going to go to treat this? Are we going to use drugs at all? Are we going to use something like chicken and rice? And, and by the way, so many people starting out in this situation, oh, this chicken and rice is wonderful. It's cheap, it's easy, and they feed that for the rest of the dog's life. And lo and behold, <laughs> so many problems turn up. But anyway. That's okay, true. So that's, that's my convoluted approach at this stage, but it does take a little bit of experience from the vet. But you've got to be willing to be a vet. Use your skills as a vet and use some basic common sense and some... Um, just know that raw foods work. And and I appreciate um, you saying that because especially with the shortage of veterinarians and everyone being so rushed, so commonly this pet owner would walk into their veterinarian and say, hey, this is what I tried to do, would immediately, you know, get berated for trying to do that. And then, you know, here's here's your drugs that are going to clear up the problem and you have to immediately go back to this other food or even worse, you know, a hydrolyzed diet or whatever. Um, and so that history taking as for holistic veterinarians we our history taking is a whole different ball game from the traditional you know okay he's got diarrhea great when did it start great here's your drugs um so it's a it, it is very very different like you're right we want for a dog where this is a GI problem, we want to go back to what was this puppy weaned on to? <laughs> and, you know, with, all right, give me four years worth of what this dog has been eating. So it is uh, very different. So I really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Royal, what are you going to do with four year old Frankie who is just. And he's a Frenchie. So, you know, this is a common Frenchie problem. I, I will say in practice, this is a common Frenchie problem. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm going to call one of these two gents. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you gonna call? <laughs> can I can I go off right? Um no, so I mean, you know, this is this is a very common problem that we see, and a lot of times things are, are immediately blamed on the raw food. So obviously that's you know, it, it it isn't really the problem because I do have thousands of animals also that eat 
very fresh, very good raw food, and they're fine. So the issue really is probably going to be looking into the history, which I do agree 100%. I think that the art of history taking and the art of even just the physical exam seems to be sort of just gone. We, we, we rely on blood tests and so many other things, the laboratory, much more than we rely on our own hands. So for me, also just checking checking the dog over, doing all that, obviously, I would be doing that pretty thoroughly. Um and making sure I can tell things like, you know, how gassy is this dog? Like what's happening in there? And you want to, you want to look for some basic things. You also really do want to know with your history, what was the weaning like? I mean, did they just suddenly say, you know what? Kibble food's no good. Tomorrow I'm going to feed fresh raw food. And that means that the population of bacteria in that GI tract that was waiting for carbohydrates and all of that stuff that's in the kibble food, they got nothing the next day and they all died at the same time. If you get a population of bacteria dying at the same time, I know what that causes in the GI tract and you get some serious problems. There's going to be a weird feedback because a lot of those carb eating bacteria are stimulating the brain to eat more carbs and all of a sudden they're gone. So there you've got this brain sort of going, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be eating. I'm not going to be desperate to eat the way I used to be about the carb food but I might develop a much more normal appetite somewhere down the road. So there may be a lot of other things going on, like we didn't wean properly. Because if you wean slowly, then the bacteria die slowly as they go along, and then other bacteria have a time to chance to make the population of the GI tract healthier. So if I can't really get a handle on it that way, then another thing you can do is you can do a biome test, and you can actually just, I can send that out while I'm trying to figure everything else out. And if it's not working, I've got an answer, speaking of tests where they map out the bacteria that's in there. And I can see like, what's going on in the bacteria in this gut? Like, is it completely overgrown with Clostridium or something else? Maybe we just, we just have a, a problem. So you can do that. And maybe this changeover has caused some problem with the biome in the animal. And, you know, biomes is sort of a big thing. We need to feed the bacteria that are appropriate for a dog. And when they're eating kibble their whole life, you got bacteria in there that are so so touchy. They're bacteria. They're like people who say, my dog has a sensitive stomach. I'm like, your dog has sensitive bacteria. The like, dog is fine. The dog should be a tank. The dog is a scavenger. There should be like nothing going on. I'm like, you got all these whiny bacteria in there. Let's get rid of them. So it's, to me. I'm going to use that. I really like that. <laughs> whiny bacteria. Get them out of there. <laughs> we can address those things. I mean, and also making sure that maybe, you know, we don't have something else, obviously looking Giardia, things like that. And then I also find sometimes it's really important to remember that hormones play a big role in this too. So looking for some simple blood tests or things like that, where maybe they can't handle a change because they're maybe, you know, a weird Addisonian or they've got other things. So don't forget that if your body can't make cortisol, you may make a change and get a little inflammation of it's out of control and maybe you haven't noticed it so much before because the dog's sort of sloggy anyway because it's on kibble food. So, you know, there's things like that you can do. And then I think really important bit that we haven't mentioned, what about the treats? What are the treats are being given chronically? Is there a lot of peanut butter with different medications? Is there anything else going on that's chronic that maybe is feeding the wrong bacteria and also making things trouble and we suddenly changed over to something like that too, or we've always been doing it along the way and it's just created its own problem. So our treats are supposed to be, um, you know, in line as well. So I, I'm addressing everything that comes in, but you know, my first time appointments an hour long, so let's jump going through. <laughs> Good point. I, 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 I appreciate you throwing in the treats because that is commonly overlooked and, you know, it, it is kind of funny that I will have people who they fill out all their paperwork and they have this beautiful diet that they're feeding and then they list the treats that they're giving and it's like, wow, it never dawned on them that the bad stuff in there. The, red dye number 40. Oh, yeah, yeah, propylene glycol, red dye number 40, salt, maltodextrin, you know, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> so it is, it is true. You have to, you have to consider everything that goes yeah. in. And then when you're healing something like that, then you have to consider it even more. So like, you know, adding things that are going to be the good bacteria to help fight, like doing things like goat milk or, the, you know, we already talked about that, like making things better and just slowly <laughs> adding things in like tripe and stuff. Those are all terrific suggestions doing it relatively slowly and you gotta help you gotta help your dog perfect thank you everyone all right so we got one more round um so dr nick you're in the upper left on my computer so uh, <laughs> you, you just come up first um 
Top three nutrition tips for dog parents wanting to keep their dog healthy and to help prevent disease. Top three nutrition tips. I should have read the script before we uh, before we went on air, shouldn't I? <laughs> okay, so straight straight off the top of my head, I'm going to say top three nutrition tips are treats should have one ingredient. They should be dried meat. If your dog is intolerant to chicken or beef or lamb or whatever it might be, then you've got to make sure that you that that, that they are not going in. So treats have one ingredient which is the protein period people really really get that you know because they just they just look on the pack and go oh five ingredients <laughs> and, and nowadays there's there's so, so many treats you know there's a lot of money in treats so you know, there's a lot of people who make food say so, you know we make a few quid on the on the on the food but the treats yay so <laughs> There's, there's a lot of great treats out there. Uh, if, they, if they're if um, they sustainably or regeneratively sourced, even better. But just, you know, do your best with those things. Don't feed treats that are going to cause problems. So that would be number one. Number two is, uh, as you can see, bone broth. I love bone broth. Always have some bone broth in the freezer because if the dog is gets a little bit, uh, has a little bit of vomiting, uh, bone broth is very good electrolyte replacer. Ian's wonderful uh, suggestion of tea and lemon and honey. honey. Honey is lovely. I've never heard that, but the tannins are very good at kind of sealing up tissue. So that's a great idea. I'm going to steal that one. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so bone broth in the freezer, you know, you can use it for, for, for puppies. You can use it for the oldies if they're kind of off their food a little bit. You can use it for pregnant. You can use it for post-surgery, just to kind of kickstart the appetite. So there are very few conditions where bone broth isn't a, just an absolute winner. So that's a wonderful thing to, to have in the, uh, in the back. And the final thing I'm going to say is when you're feeding uh, chews, Make sure that the chews have fur on. And, there, and this would be, uh, you got fur, furry bunny ears. We get those over here. Do you guys get those? Yeah, yeah. you get those? Yeah. Okay. You get bunny, bunny feet, ears. Bunny, bunny ears. Bunny feet, bunny ears. As long as it's got fur on, that's really, really good. Also, over here, you can get venison hide, where they take a square of venison like this, and they, they roll it and dry it. So you've got this tube of really tough, really thick venison hide. So it makes for fantastic chewing. No way is any dog short of Cerberus is going to, is going to get through that in any, in any, any time. Okay. So it makes for good chewing. Yeah. Some people don't like to feed bones and therefore you've got some, something to clean the teeth. But the most important thing is that fur contains contains manganese and many of the the many raw food diets because they don't contain fur are a bit low on manganese uh it, because if you think about it back in the old days the dog would bring down their prey or they would eat the bunny probably whole or the rat or the rabbit or the whatever it might be and they would take in the fur and that would be part of the of the of the nutrients that they would take whereas nowadays we 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 give them meat and bone and organ no fur you see and that's not a great that's that's a that's we've overlooked that and so we need to reintroduce that to our thinking so there you go uh treats with fur it would be my third thing so that so we've got um uh, bone broth uh in the freezer uh we've got treats single protein uh dried treats and we've got all the chews have to have fur on how's that judy is that good that's very cool that's that is very cool <laughs> we don't have those rolled venison hide chews here i'm gonna have to look into that oh yeah if, never seen yeah. those or, or we have bunny ears and feet got but bunny ears. if you you, 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 may, you must have people who shoot deer you know to, to, to cull them in forests and things like that there's there's a business opportunity for you here's a, I, I, hey taking notes <laughs> right right all right dr ian what are your top three nutrition tips for uh keeping dogs healthy and preventing disease uh very simple number one Feed raw food and don't be afraid. <laughs> <of it. laughs> Number two, 
Feed food. Feed food. Kibble is not food. Yes. It's stock feed of the very worst kind. So feed actual food and raw and make it sure it's a wide variety of foods and must be appropriate for the species that you're feeding. And number three, feed raw meaty bones on a regular basis because that's the essence of health for a dog. Dogs are scavengers and they have grown up over evolutionary time eating lots of raw meaty bones. Therefore, their bodies require the nutrients in those bones. And it's no good just feeding a calcium carbonate supplement or something, whatever, as, a, as an artificial form of bone, because you're only you're not giving them hydroxyapatite, you're not giving them any, the fat in the bone, you're not giving them the protein in the bones and the raw meaty bones, you're not giving them the marrow contents. There's so many things you are doing wrong if you think you're going to substitute bone with calcium carbonate or some other form of artificial calcium, even if it's um, ground up eggshells, whatever. So there are my three tips. Feed raw, don't be afraid. Feed food, a wide variety of the appropriate type, and um, feed lots of raw meaty bones. And, and by the way, there's a fair bit of manganese too in the raw meaty bones. But anyway, I'll just throw that in for what it is worth. And nobody realizes how important that manganese is until the ACL tears and you have to pay $4,000 for surgery and then you go, oh, should have had more manganese in the diet. So. <laughs> As a young, um, I can't remember whether it was a veterinarian, an agricultural science student, whatever, there was a condition called porosis in, 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 I think it was in chickens where they had slipping tendons and it was a manganese deficiency. Well, there you go. See, we should have known that from the chickens and transferred that over to our dogs who are blowing ACLs right and left. <laughs> I got that right, but it's a, it's a long time ago, but there was this condition <laughs> slipping tendons and magnets. Anyway. All right, well, some, something for us to look into. Uh, yeah. Okay, Dr. Royal, what are your top three nutrition tips for dog parents wanting to keep their dog healthy and prevent disease? I like all of these. They're really good. <laughs> I, I do have my own, but yeah, um, I did, would say about the food thing. I do love just saying like food, like food that your grandmother would recognize. It's so good. It's Michael Pollan says a lot of that for humans. And it's just so wonderful to read what he talks about, but um, it is something, I mean, food is food really should be food. It should be, you know, um, something like food for your soul too. It should make sense to you when you feed. <laughs> but so basic, so basic anyway. Okay. So for me, my three are one is I would, Try to try with the dog. I would try to feed once a day. It's a really easy thing you can do to make things better for everything. So feeding once a day, if you're feeding a fresh raw food, you can do this. It's harder to do this if you're feeding a kibble because then you're doing this huge amount of kibble, a big bunch of it into the stomach, <laughs> and then it's like a big cement ball and sitting around and more like with the house blow. So, so if you're watching this and you're feeding kibble, just no, 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 do that, okay? <laughs> for those of you that feed fresh raw, more likely, um, feed once a day and try to feed at a random time because the, there's a difference between being empty and being hungry. So I, I try to remind my clients every day that the dog is sort of expecting and their, their stomach is 70% of their GI tract and our stomach is like 30% of our GI tract. So there's quite a difference. They're expecting like, give me a big, I just killed something. I want to put it all into the pocket of my stomach. And we're sort of little monkeys and we want to eat, well, we're great apes, but whatever. We're, we want to eat three times a day or whatever we want to do because our little stomachs, they're going to want a bigger meal. So they're always going to be a little dissatisfied if we're feeding them twice a day and it's half the amount for the day. And they're like, I never really got enough that first meal. And so, so one, you're not really satisfying them. And two, they really would only eat once a day in, in the wild, you know, or in ancestry, or maybe even less than that. Right. So if they're not really successful that day, they'll have the next day, but being empty is not a problem for them. They're completely happy to be empty. It, it should not cause them to vomit bile. And I have a lot of people like, if I don't feed on time, my dog vomits bile. I'm like, well, why is there a time that you feed your dog? That's not normal. Like dogs don't know, like every day at four o'clock, a rabbit comes by and I get that one. <laughs> and that's, that's a problem because what happens is in our world, we're like, I'm the best owner in the world. I feed at eight o'clock morning, eight o'clock night, every day. And the problem with that is 
the, the dog knows that too. They're not stupid. They can tell time. We know that, <laughs> right? But they would never put time and food together. So if you put time and food together for them every single day, they're going to be like, yeah, about seven o'clock, I'm going to get fed in an hour. I'm going to start to drool, Pavlov's dogs. I'm going to start to make saliva down here. I'm going to add enzymes to it and acids. My stomach's going to start to, it's going to start because it's thinking about the food. And then you've got this stomach full of acid and enzymes and bile and stuff. And it's just sitting there waiting for food. And you don't feed on time. Right around eight o'clock, the the stomach goes, I can't put this further into the intestines because the intestines can't handle the acid. No chance. There's no place for this to go. It's been sitting in here too long. There's no food. Whoop! I'm going to vomit it out. Right? Don't create that system. Don't feed at the same time every day. And if you only feed once a day, then you're also going to decrease the amount of time that the body is processing food. And while they're processing food, they shut down their natural mitochondrial cleanup mechanism, looking for weird cells and cancers and things like that. I want that mitochondrial cleanup system on as much as possible in my patients because I want them to clean up their cells and look for cancers and do that. So you feed them once a day, they process the food, six hours, eight hours, it's done. The rest of the time they turn on their mitochondrial cleanup and they're going to be avoiding the huge statistic of cancers and inflammation and things are going to be a healthier animal. And that's been, this has been shown to be true in a really elegant study of the difference between twice a day feeding and once a day feeding risk factors are just way different. So if you, you, you've got longevity on your side, if you feed once a day, you've got much less cancer, much less inflammation and that. So it's an easy thing to do and something we all should do. So that's my number one. And that's the longest explanation. <laughs> Can I applaud that, Barbara? That is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, that is. I, I love that, that explanation so cool. because I hear that all the time. The hunger pukes, like, oh, I have to give them a snack at bedtime. Otherwise, you know, we're going to puke in the middle of the night. I have to get up at five in the morning to feed him before he starts puking. That that's brilliant. I just, you know, why it came to the reason it came to me mainly is because I did a lot of zoo and wildlife medicine, and I just thought about it, like. Imagine if all of the dogs in the wild, like a wild dog in Africa, I just came back from Africa. It was super cool, right? So wild dogs in Africa, if when they didn't hunt successfully, they vomited up, they're very expensive to produce enzymes and acids, and they just vomited it all up again and wasted all that energy. They're all dead. That's a bad idea evolutionarily. Don't vomit when you don't eat. That makes no sense. So and for me, Barbara, like, that, again, you've actually gone to an evolutionary principle. Oh, I love it. It is so good. And, and it's so and simple. Guess what else? Ten, I've been doing this for 10 years. Guess what it does? It works. Yeah. Every, <laughs> every time. So that's why I know it's true, really. It's not like I just made it up. I was like, yeah. But it totally works every time. All these people were like, now my, my husband and I get up at three in the morning to feed the dog because he vomits. Now, it used to be seven, and then it was six, and then it was five. Like, that's because you set up that system, and it's an hour before. Anyway. So yes, it works, and it's a great one. So feed once a day, but do it at random times so they don't know when food time is. They have no idea. Oh, food, it's the best thing ever. I love food. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, and just think about it too. Like if you have a snake, you're going to feed twice a month maybe. And that's for that species, right? If you fed every day, your snake fed every day, your snake would get sick. So you have a dog, it really shouldn't eat that often. It doesn't understand it. Okay. Barbara. Yes. Random, once a day. The acronym is ROAD. That's uh, the road, the road to health. Hit the road. <laughs> the road to health. Random to once health. a day is R-O-A-D. The road okay. to health. I love your acronym. Yeah. You make me so happy. God, you know, I was an English major, and this is important to me. Okay. All right, guys. So That'll be in her next book. The road to health. You and me, we're writing the road to health. That's the next one. Okay, guys, I got these down. They're, it's being recorded, right? Okay. Um, okay, so so then number two for me is know your ingredients. So just know your ingredients. Just I, people always say they say, oh, you know, I decided to feed this new thing. I'm like, okay, what's in it? Uh, I don't know. Like you put it in your <laughs> you, what, what read read it read what it is at least once at least once. It doesn't take that long. Could be really boring, but do, but do it anyway. So and are they bad? Is it, if it's food, does it seem balanced enough? Is it, is it sourced well? Because guess what? We love animals. Let's love the food animals that feed our animals. Let's make them happy too. Because we all animal loving people. And then, you know, variety. Know that you're doing something. They're like, always do the same thing. I was just saying, like, oh, God, you know, variety. We've, we've mentioned that before, right, Ian? So, so we've got to do variety. So know your foods. Get to know some things you can do. Change it up. And so, you know, even change brands. Do all that. But know your ingredients and know who the best ones are. That's number two. 
Um, and then that will also help us with our soil, which by the way, is super important. <laughs> um, and then the third one for me is offer raw bones for sure. Like I just help it's, 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 it's from, it's so important to get raw bones, certainly from the nutrition aspect of it. And, but also this head and mouth in a dog is made to kill the animal, eat the animal, and then chew on the bones. So if you don't let them do that, everybody knows when you, like you don't use your legs to walk, guess what they're going to do? They're going to wither and atrophy. Well, guess what happens? You get older dogs with these little temporal muscles that go all flat. You get some different jaw, jaw problems and TMJ problems. They get sunken in here. The biome in the mouth gets better, gets bad. The You get terrible dental tartar because they're not chewing on something and getting the shearing force on those teeth. The gingiva get all wombly and they grow weird growths and stuff. All of that stuff is like, I should be just gnawing on a bone. You know, get my get my face and my everything working. I help my ears function better. I don't get as many ear infections to their ah, ah. Chew on raw bones. It's awesome. They're made to do that. Otherwise, they lose the function. Awesome. <laughs> you, you, I, I knew I picked the right three people for this. This was, this was amazing. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm so excited for the summit um, because I, I, I can't wait to see these interviews again. I, 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 you know, it's one of those things, the more, you, the more you hear things, the more it sinks in and you always hear something new that you didn't hear before. Um, and this is, I, I love talking to like-minded people but people that i always learn something new like i learned new things tonight just in our kickoff party i learned new things when i interviewed everyone in this summit and i am really excited for the summit so uh I hope everyone who is watching will continue to watch through the summit, see all these amazing lectures that we have coming up. You are going to learn so much and you are going to feel so much better about being able to make good choices and good decisions for how to feed your dogs, keep them healthy and improve the longevity and keep them with you longer. That's what we all want. We all want our dogs to be with us forever. We'll get as close to forever as we can. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. You are all amazing. <laughs>